I went to Kashmir in 1989, my takeoff out of Sydney was delayed by a bomb threat against Air India as the plane taxied down the emergency escape chute and whisked out of harm's way by the Australian Federal Police. Sikh separatists were blamed for a series of threats and bombings on Air India at the time. I watched the brave German Shepherd sniffer dogs bound aboard and clear the plane. There was no bomb. I met some other foreign nationals in Kashmir on the houseboat where we stayed. They were overconfident. They bragged of being secret service agents of a western nation, well known for its espionage. I didn't believe them at the time, and so asked if they'd done military training. They replied they had. These men openly smoked hashish in India, where such a crime is severely punished. They were seemingly unabashed and were very much focused on harassing local Kashmiri children and poor working people. These secret agent friends would never tell me their full name, and they would become aggressive if I pointed the camera their way. I have since come to realise that Kashmir is a significant barometer for the world. Here it witnessed moderate Islam in 1989 being turned into enemy and being blamed for acts of terrorism against the state that were committed by parties undetermined. Peaceful Kashmir was caught, if not set, in policy by multinational agendas. Twenty years on from filming this material, I read on conspiracy theory websites that certain Western military trainers, perhaps just like those in the houseboat, were posing as crazy backpackers on holiday in Kashmir during their reconnaissance. Their uncouth behaviour toward Kashmiri locals, including cheating taxi drivers and lodgers, was well known. I read these Westerners are in Kashmir to train Indians on their side of the India-Pakistan-Kashmiri line of control. I read that they maintain a military training facility known as the Ibex Centre 
outside of Leh, the capital of Ladakh. There they train Tibetan exiles and local Buddhist soldiers who serve in the Ladakh scouts, the mountain commandos who patrol the Indian side of the line of control and the Seishin Glacier. They say on these websites that certain Westerners and others also train the Tibetan army, the crack Indian army unit known as the Special Frontier Force. The training takes place at the Missouri Parachute Jump Base in northern India. Kashmiri separatists claim these Westerners, as trainers, have served with the Tibetan commandos in quelling insurgencies in Assam. In 2006, I read the beautiful book Shalima the Clown by Salman Rushdie and I thought fondly about my Shikara paddler Aziz and his family. I wondered whether they had survived the burn everything purges by the Indian military that Rushdie so eloquently exposed. Had they survived the presumption that all locals are guilty until they can prove they're not? Had Aziz and his brothers escaped being forced to fight for Lashka e Toiba or any of the other groups? Had the girls escaped the techniques of war, of acid being thrown on them, of rape, beheadings, burnings, humiliation? Had their Shikara business survived? Had they managed to take their skills with them as a family unit, dependent upon one another? I remembered when I was there how the men worked at ferrying people and produce. They built shikaras and piled wood for the cold winter. Women, children and old folk wove rugs and grew vegetables in floating gardens. I went to visit a cooperative in Srinagar where cotton, wool and silk carpets are made by hand. They let me film them. Corporation, it's a co-op. Mm -hmm. We have got working people here, work together and share it together. This is made of cotton. Huh? Oh. Just like going to the school for the first day, you don't know the boys around or in the office, you mm -hmm. count giving going more and more, then you know the people that are around there. Same thing is with this with the carpet. When you come to know the design of these yes. symbols, yes. you love it more and more. This used to be the court stamp. This we call the sign of Allah also, the sign of the palm, oh, yeah. the paisley. Then we have got here the fountain of justice. Mm -hmm. Then we have the tree of love. Mm -hmm. and then we have the, again the sign here, the Mughal sign here. Mm -hmm. See, Sir, the first one. One is different, the family is different. Because every color bears something, you know. Now when we change this again, other direction it will be a different carpet, mm -hmm. entirely a different one. Thank you. Now see the color, the magic part oh, of the yeah, carpet. Yeah. Look at that. Beautiful. Probably we're selling these them. Um, when people buy, they see the price of a silk carpet more, and they say we have bought a silk carpet for less price. Yes. But they buy this as a silk there. Oh, I see. It is like a silk, but it is not silk. This but is the wool. It's wool. It's Just yeah. pure wool. I feared for Aziz's family, that deep, old suspicions about neighbours, or from neighbours, materialised into angry mobs with fire, clubs and sticks, who came knocking, brought on by rumour and fears started by the military, 
by Lashka e Toiba or other shadowy agitators. Perhaps their family escaped all of this to refugee camps before the boys could be forced into being terrorists, to live in leaking tents supplied by the Indian government in a floodplain in southern Kashmir. Or had they escaped to other parts of India to work, if they could for a pittance, and so disappear in ethnic cleansing forever from Kashmir? Now, would you like to see some leather?
I took the bus to one of the most beautiful places on earth, the town of Pahalagam, the village of shepherds. Unfortunately, the three braggarts from our houseboat, who said they were secret service agents, were on the same bus. They had put hydrogen peroxide in their hair, presumably to stand out in the crowd. I also began to notice Indian security men everywhere. Military helicopters flew close over tall pines. Taxis were searched for firearms or men stashed in the boot. I met an Indian couple from London who stayed close when they could. They said terrorists would avoid shooting them, as in 1989, Westerners were still valued tourists. Buses with Westerners on board were not likely to be sprayed with bullets. I also visited this town, Sonomarg. It spectacularly rests in the Sin Valley, the largest tributary of the Valley of Kashmir. 100 kilometers long, the valley and deep gorge open to grassy slopes on the road to Leh, to which I recall my bleached-haired acquaintances on the houseboat said they regularly traveled when the road was open. My bleached haired friends also turn up at Sonomark. One of them approached me and laughingly said, Watch this! He confronted the man who was our bus driver on the ascent, saying that he had arranged for this man's replacement. This man, he pointed out, had a growth across his left eye. This would surely cause impaired vision and thus was a safety issue on such perilous mountain roads. The three peroxide heads argued loudly. They would not travel with this man and so a replacement was critical for safety. This orchestrated a fight between the driver and the man who they would have as replacement. The fight between the two quickly grew into a fighting crowd the police arrived and rifle butts were used to drive away onlookers and arrest those at the centre. The three western spies crawled out from that fighting crowd and stood watching. One of them noted how fine a joke they had played.
Routinely, the peroxide heads refused to pay the correct fare, and 20 years later, using the internet, I read about this black ops work. The bleached heads hired this small boy as a regular shikara paddler to take them far out into Dal Lake. Local convention held that small boys in training were only suitable for quick trips from the pier to a nearby houseboat, so the fare was generally lower. The peroxide heads bragged at the deal they were getting, small boy ferrying rates to the outer limits of Dal Lake. I saw the peroxide heads shouting at the boy, accusing him of being too lazy to ferry them, and so they should take possession of his paddle and shikara. I watched as they threw the boy into the water, they laughed as he struggled for breath. My shikara paddler, Aziz, manoeuvred to rescue. Another shikara plucked the drowning boy from the water. Later, and reportedly, angered by the peroxide head's actions, unknown assailants abducted the three at gunpoint as they paddled around in the shikara they took from the small boy. Sultana, the houseboat owner, said that, according to police, the peroxide head's special military training had enabled them to overpower their abductors and shoot them. They left their abductors floating and dying in Dal Lake. With an international incident on the boil, the Indian police and the military acted decisively and took the three to Srinagar Airport. Back at the houseboat, I was asked by Sultana to witness the safe packing of their belongings. Backpacks, jeans, passports, cigarettes, cameras, money and an empty bottle of peroxide. All this had to be checked so that the local Kashmiris could not be accused of stealing. I was witness and then had to accompany the baggage in its delivery to the pier and a waiting military truck.
Thank <laughs> you. 